talked about this just briefly a few minutes ago, but what innovative ideas and incentives do you propose to attract grocery stores in District 3? Grocery stores in District 3. We're going to start with this company. Businesses make decisions as to where they're going to locate based on statistics, pure and simple. If you don't have the number of people, you don't have a certain income level, you're only going to get a certain type of grocery store that's interested in the area. It's going to take some additional development, some additional bodies, houses, uh, apartments. I know people don't want to hear that, but that is the reality of what you're, look, uh, of what you're looking at. It's a business decision. It's about making money. Now, what I have always advocated, uh, and I've thought this for years, some of the largest chains, they pretty much so, I believe they need to come up with some concepts that are tailored to fit a community and the statistics that they look at in certain areas. So that's why you've seen different concepts being used. And Ms. Scott. Okay, so my plan uh, for our district, uh, far as addressing the grocery stores, addressing businesses in our area, is um, to kind of go more on what she said, is that yes, you need business in order to have growth. Okay, but you can, you can judge or you can gauge how much business is done in your community and how it benefits your community. Okay, so my goal is yes, we need me. We need uh, grocery stores, yes. Uh, but what I plan to do is build an incentive package with developers who come into our community. And one of the incentives is they have to, uh, they have to be invested in our nonprofits in our community that are heavily involved in our community. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, um, 3,000 children live homeless today in the city of Dallas. I went to a meeting today. 3,000. Okay, and the city of Dallas only gives this organization $50,000 to assist the 3,000 people. Okay, so I want to build those gaps uh, between businesses, nonprofits, and our community. Thank you, Ms. Nunn. Thank you. Mr. Peters. All right, so uh, some innovative ideas I have uh, concerning the addressing the food desert situation in Dallas or District 3 is, um, you know, uh, establishing a food co-op uh, instead of just, you know, build, getting a, a regular store in here, we could, um, you know, reach out to the community, have people who actually live in the community ha uh, uh, buy memberships uh, to this or pay for memberships for the, uh, the store and then that could help pay for it and also you can get uh, food delivered straight to your doorstep and that would be part, part of the, the, uh, the package. Um, there's a store called Urban Acres and uh, by the Bishop Arts District. This is uh, one example like this. Um, they also contract with uh, local farmers and local gardeners. This is another thing that um, I would like to do, uh, you know, um, uh, incentivize people in the community to be a part of that process and um, also uh, reach out to the community to uh, build this uh, grocery store and incentivize people here. Uh, 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 get our produce local because we can get all these big stores here but the reality is um, you know they're poisoning the food we have GMO uh, food Mr. and um, yeah so innovative ideas and incentives uh, number one is the district grocery store task force looking at different ways and different options in order to bring quality access quality fresh fruits and vegetables into the dish I don't know how many had a chance to go out to Bonton Forms if you haven't you should go Thank you. Go and see Bonton Forms. Darren Babcock has done amazing things over there. Matter of fact, I talked with Darren a couple of weeks ago, and he said, I would love to be able to build a Bonton Forms in District 3. I said, let's sit down, let's talk about it. Incentives. We have to get our economic development director in the room. Recently, and many of you who live in District 3 in this area know, we had conversations with Ann's food market. We're still in conversations about that. But we're seeing what we can do, what incentive the city can offer. We offered $100,000, $100,000 through the South Dallas Square Park Opportunity Fund. That money went for Bunton Forms, and that money went to build Bunton Forms, which is now a place where people in South Dallas Square Park can come, sit down, eat, and uh, have a comfortable environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. We have a 
The next question was almost verbatim from two different people, so I'm going to kind of mash them together for one. Um, District 3 has ample affordable housing now. This is a question from, from the audience. Um, what are you willing to do to prevent substandard developers, builders, property owners from entering District 3, lowering home values, and at the same time encourage developers to build quality homes for mid to upper income residents in District 4? Quality housing. I'm sorry, District 3. I, I'm saying, no, that's habit. <laughs> <laughs> District 3. Sorry. What are you willing to do to prevent substandard developers, builders, and property owners from entering District 3 and lowering the existing home values? And how would you encourage developers to build quality homes for mid to upper income residents in District 3? We're going to start with Mr. Scott. I'm sorry, Ms. Scott. I'm sorry, Ms. Scott. Scott. I'm going to get it. <laughs> so I get some smiles. All right. Um, so, excuse me, I used to be a teacher, so I talk loud. Uh, so, uh, to answer the question, um, basically what I was planning on doing is uh, creating. Um, certain agreements with developers that want to build in our area. So if we want if we want to protect the home home value, which I understand, I am a homeowner myself uh, in Mountain Creek. I understand uh, the importance of your home value. Um, so, excuse me, uh, so to protect your area, um, we, I will plan on building, or plan on uh, working with developers, working with local, um, entities who are interested in our area to uh, create guidelines. Uh, so if they want to live, if they want to build in our area, they want to provide homes in our area, there are certain guidelines that they would have to follow in order to provide those services. Thank you. Mr. Peters. So to uh, encourage, to, to maintain the property value uh, in our districts, what I would do uh, concerning developers trying to come here and, uh, you know, uh, develop what we would do is we would uh, uh, create requirements and uh, just pretty much you know build a culture and a, a, a standard create a standard uh, if you want to do business in district 3 then um, there's a certain quality uh, of business that we we, uh, we want here and there will be certain requirements and also uh, for people who, who are um, who want to develop here and also uh, you know uh, add to the value we would also incentivize them uh, of course and uh, you know continue to uh, uh, Increase the value in our uh, community, so more uh, more business will come down to uh, District Three. All right, that's really simple. The one ace that uh, council members have is we approve or disapprove zoning changes. So one, we have to make sure when a zoning case comes that we have a commissioner who's going to be neighborhood focused, neighborhood friendly, and have neighborhood interest first and foremost in mind. We went through this a couple of years ago, I'm glad Craig is here, because he's been a big advocate for making sure that we don't have uh, substandard housing developers and many others, Raymond, many others uh, in our district. And so making sure at the zone, because we can kill a case at the planning and zoning level before it even gets to the council. And so we want to make sure that whoever that builder is has a credible reputation. Our housing director has to make sure that we have certain standards in our housing policy to make sure that anyone who's looking to do any kind of housing, any kind of building, any kind of development has a quality reputation. We had a case a couple of years ago where I said no on the zoning, they came back and they planted it, so we're holding them accountable to do what they said they're going to do. Thank you very much. <coughs> thing that I would do is that I talk to the neighborhood uh, to explain uh, what's being proposed and find out from that neighborhood what they want to see, what type of building they want to happen in their neighborhood. In terms of substandard developers, personally I wouldn't deal with them at all. Uh, I'd be looking for credible uh, 
developers, people who have come in, built a project, and they've kept their promises to the neighborhood. They've kept their properties up. If they wanted to change ownership, that they basically came to the neighborhood uh, and introduced that uh, new landlord, if you will, coming in. Uh, but I believe that basically substandard housing, we don't need that. We've got that based on just the aging of properties that were new at one time, and they kept being sold and sold and sold over and over again. And now we have Thank a bunch you. of uh, absentee landowners. Thank you, Ms. statistics and we all know that the uh, senior population is growing exponentially we're in the age of the baby boomers um, and so the question is what initiatives can be put in place to assist residents over 65 years of age so that they can stay within code compliance and regulation and I'm going to add on to this just to make sure that they are able to maintain their homes and remain in their homes 65 years and older. What initiatives? Okay, um, so speaking with uh, some of the residents in District 3, I did uh, receive certain concerns because uh, certain residents that I uh, visited, uh, she said, well, my neighbors are parking all in my driveway or close to my driveway, I can't back out, or the music is loud, or, you know, I'm getting older, I can't do these things on my own. Uh, we will. I would want to provide programs with the city of Dallas to kind of assist uh, our elderly um, that kind of follow along with uh, either our nonprofits or with uh, city initiatives, which we do have. Uh, we have community block grants uh, that can assist um, different organizations who actually help our communities. So um, the money is there. It's just how we allocate those resources to help our elderly and protect them. Thank you. Mr. Peters. Uh, well, one thing, um, uh, DART decided to uh, end the paratransit uh, services for the uh, elders and decided to contract with uh, uh, you know, a third party such as uh, Uber and Lyft and things of that nature. So um, I think you know, I, I, I would want to bring, one of the, bring those services back to our elders so they can get to work, get to uh, appointments, get to the doctor, um, uh, things of that nature. Other services uh, such as, you know, simple things like uh, having ramps and uh, handicap services at the house, having lights um, in their in their uh, neighborhoods, in their, in their um, excuse me, in their yard. So these are some of the things that, you know, the, the elders have been uh, making uh, aware to me when I'm knocking at the door, things of that nature. Mr. Thomas. But as chair of the Human Associate Needs Committee, the Office of Senior Affairs and Senior Affairs Commission reports to my committee. And so we started a series of listening sessions. We had two here, the only council member that hosted two listening sessions for our Senior Affairs. Mr. John Johnson back there is our representative on the Senior Affairs Commission. He's also vice chair. Thank you for your service. Uh, we have a very aggressive group of seniors who are on the Senior Affairs Commission. They've developed a very aggressive agenda. And so in this upcoming budget, the one thing that we don't have is we don't have a place within the Office of Senior Affairs where they have a contact person, one person who's a point of contact for our community. Whenever you call this particular office, this particular person. So in the upcoming budget, I'm gonna allocate, uh, I'm gonna recommend we allocate 75 to $100,000 for someone in the Office of Senior Affairs who's that point person who can make sure that if our seniors are having issues with cold, then they're communicating that information to our city manager, T.C. Broadnax. So when our code, go, our code inspectors go out, they're mindful of that. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Amen. We have an aging population in Dallas in certain areas. Their kids are grown, gone. Uh, they want to live uh, in the community that they've been in for years. Uh, and they have a lot of challenges trying to live on, live on fixed incomes. One of the things that has not been mentioned, uh, basically by anybody who's been sitting here, is that we're talking about tax dollars, but 
there's a limited amount of tax dollars that can go into some of these programs. We need to look more towards our corporate uh, population, not only in Texas, but in the country, to get them to step up and partner with some of the public entities to provide solutions for seniors. Because we're all invested in the senior population, be it a mother, father, brother, sister. All right, this is a really good question. Everybody listen to this. There's a significant gap for emergency calls uh, reported from the southern section. A significant gap in the sense of urgency for emergency calls reported from the southern section. How would you improve emergency response times to better protect our neighborhoods? This is a safety issue, okay? What would you do, what would you propose to improve emergency response times to better protect our neighborhoods? Um. One thing I would do is, you know, look at the technology that the, uh, the officers are using. They're saying that, or dispatchers are using, they're saying that, um, you know, the, the equipment is uh, out of date and, and things of that nature. So we would look at that, and also beyond that, we would um, incentivize the, the officers to uh, do their job, um, um, hold them responsible to these times. I don't, I don't see why uh, there would be a response time uh, delay. It seems like these officers are not uh, interested, uh, or, or they're, they're uh, caught up in their time. So we, if we need to bring, put more officers uh, on the streets or uh, whatever it is, I would like to work with a, a police chief or whoever uh, to get more information on this and you know provide the options because we need to be safe in our community. Mr. Thomas. Hey, we're going uh, emergency response time. First, we've got to look at two different areas. We got police and we got fire rescue. We just had a briefing last Monday where the response time for Dallas Fire Rescue is at a level lower than it's been in several years. We have a new fire chief. He rolled out his vision and his plan. I'm supporting him 110%. As far as police, one of the issues that we have is we have um, DPD officers who are taking phone calls. Those officers need to be out on the street. So we need to take civilians, train those civilians, let them be the 311 and 911 operators who can facilitate those calls, get that information out, and have those who are trained and skilled out on the street. And that way we have more officers who are on the street, and those officers can respond in a much faster time period. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Compton. I'm going to say this one more time. One of the things that we need to focus on is improving basic services. The bottom line is that the city of Dallas does not have enough police officers to adequately serve the population that we have. Another thing that I think is a real big problem with the Dallas Police Department, if you look at history, there are some times of the year that are peak times where you're getting a lot of calls. One of them is New Year's Eve. I've been calling for years on New Year's Eve with all the gunfire. Now, you would think if you looked at the history, you know the areas where that's a problem. So the officers would already be prepared to go to those locations because it is a hazard. Some people don't think it is, but it is. But the bottom line is that until Dallas solves its police, Thank you, Ms. Number. Thomas. We're going to have a problem with response. Ms. Scott, your response? Okay. Um, everyone say $3 billion. $3, Three billion. billion. dollars. That's how much the city of Dallas gets in taxes uh, and other revenues. That's how much they generate every year. $3 billion. Now, you just heard that we paid $96,000 to train these police officers to patrol in your area. Okay? Now, do you want to pay $96,000 for people to be on their phone? Or do you want to pay $96,000 so that you can get a, a police post station in your neighborhood to help deter crime? So that you can have a local police station or a local, um, um, excuse me, fire department in your area. Why is it that you, as the, the citizens, as the taxpayers, have to wait a significant amount of time in order to receive services that you pay for? 
Okay, those are the things that I'm helping to address. My plan is, when if elected, my plan is to not only provide police post stations in your area, but provide better service in your area. No, our police officers should not be on their phones, but I should not have to pay $96,000 for training for them to be on their phone. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Uh, recent developments in yet another case of campaign finance violations, as well as admitted bribes from formal council persons are in the news. What steps will you take to implement or to curb if or when you are approached by investors with propositions for personal and or financial support? What steps will you take personally to curb what's been going on at City Hall? Okay, we're gonna start with Mr. Thomas. Really simple, just say no. Just say no. It's that simple. Just say no. I've been in office for four years, and not one time has anyone accused me of taking any campaign, any money from any developer, and it will not happen because I just say no. And I will tell you, don't ever come back to my office again. It's really that simple. You have to have the integrity to say no. We're public servants. We're here to serve the community. We're not here to enrich ourselves. I serve, this is my full-time job. I do this 24 hours, seven days a week. You would never imagine how many people inbox me on Facebook, text me, all hours of the night, and I'm expected to respond because I am a full-time city council member. You don't have to worry about me taking anybody's money. If you're a developer, if you want to do business in District 3, you can come and you can invest in District 3, and that way you show that you're really committed to see people in District 3 do better. Just say no. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Compton. You know, Councilman Thomas, that was a very impassioned speech. But if you look at your campaign finance report, if you look at your campaign finance report, there are a lot of developers on that. And I know them and I know what they do. But the bottom line, well, I don't know about the rural Hamilton business and what was in the newspaper. I'm not here to throw stones, but some of the people that I saw on that report, I know what they do. And that's fine. Own it. You know, just own it. But the bottom line, he's right. All you have to do is say no. One of the problems that some people in Dallas, Texas have with me is that I'm honest, okay? I don't live a lavish lifestyle. I'm not looking to. All I want to do is help the citizens improve their lives. But I cannot be the policeman and the ethics police for some people. Thank it's you, an Thompson. individual decision. Thank you. We want to make sure that we answer the questions as they are proposed. Thank okay. You. Um, so to answer your question, the answer would be no. Okay. Uh, when I take money from an investor that doesn't aim to serve my community, I am not benefiting you, okay? My answer is always no. If it's not to benefit you, your children, your community, then it has no place in our community. And I have no problem ho uh, hosting town hall meetings to let you all know that. In addition, um, our incumbent says that, well, you know, you have to prove it, okay? Someone say uh, 2250 for me. 2250 that's the amount that you're allowed to receive from an organization. Uh, 2500 excuse me. $2,500, that's the highest you're able to receive. Why is it that Roll Hamilton was able to donate three separate transactions of $3,000 to avoid that rule, okay? You deserve better, okay? And it's not about what you used to, it's about what you deserve, and that is what I'm fighting for. Thank you so much, Ms. Scott. Mr. Peters. 
like I said, just say no. Um, this is nothing I'm interested in. If anybody knows me outside of uh, you know um, what I'm doing here, they know my platform is uh, completely uh, against you know turning uh, against the people, the working class people. So I have the working class people and the um, the proletariat class people's uh, best interests in mind. Um, I will be going outside of myself and everything I stand for to uh, put uh, developers or anybody over um, us. You know what I'm saying? So that's not my background. And, um, so you would not have to worry about me uh, taking illegal uh, donations like uh, some of the city council members uh, have. And we have uh, evidence. We've been looking at campaign finance reports. Mine will always be available. Um, so um, just say no. What services, what ideas, services can you offer to nonprofit organizations to better serve the homeless and less fortunate in our community? What well, you do, it specifically asks for nonprofit organizations, but I'm, I'm asking, what would you do? What would you do to better serve the homeless and less fortunate communities um, in District 3? What I would do, I would try to connect them to organizations, corporations that uh, to fulfill the needs that they have. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Let's go. So kind of to explain what I said before, my idea or my initiative is to build the partnerships with local nonprofits that are heavily involved in our community and have uh, the contingency to prove how involved they are. Okay, uh, recently, <coughs> or a couple years ago, the Dallas, city of Dallas invested in those huts. Uh, they, you see them off of I-30. I know you see them. Okay. Six, okay. Six million dollars. Okay. Um, I want to help our homeless community. Not everyone is homeless because they chose to be homeless. They're homeless because they reach a certain point in their life where they need assistance. In the city of Dallas, like I said, the city of Dallas has those resources, has the money to provide. Um, additional incentives for those nonprofits so that they continue to provide services like Dallas Life or Volga Alcove. Those uh, entities like that serve our, not only serve our children who are facing homeless situations, but our families as well. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you. So some, uh, all right, some services um, I would like to introduce are um, giving homeless people uh, jobs, uh, things of that nature, and then also before that, uh, preventing homelessness. Um, you know, uh, having efforts to where we prevent uh, prevent it before it happens. Things like uh, implementing a pr apprenticeship programs, uh, supporting our formerly uh, formerly incarcerated individuals with apprenticeship programs, job training, so um, they won't you know they won't have to worry about uh, recidivism or going back uh, you know to um, uh, uh, career activities that uh, will land them back uh, you know in a non-favorable position, but also, like I said, uh, uh, jobs for the homeless, San Diego's doing it, they're getting the uh, homeless people to pick up uh, trash and things of that nature and pay them uh, for these things, and I think, you know, that's something we could possibly implement. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? As it relates to the homeless, one, the city of Dallas has not identified one homeless encampment in District 3, okay? There may be individuals who are homeless, but there's no homeless encampments in District 3. Okay, secondly, in terms of individuals who are homeless, the city of Dallas already has a plan, a comprehensive plan, three-part comprehensive plan to address homelessness. Number one, individuals who are homeless, there are over 50 spaces that are available for at some of the shelters in Dallas for anyone who's homeless to stay for 90 days. During those 90 days, they'll get wraparound services, they'll get health care uh, assessment, They'll get assessments for job opportunities, things of that nature. Matter of fact, the city of Dallas has a job program for homelessness. We rolled it out maybe about six months ago. One of the challenges, and I told our city manager this, we've got to do a better job of telling our story as far as the city of Dallas. City of Dallas is doing a great job. We have staff who work extremely hard, but we don't do a good job of telling our story. So there are many programs to, to provide help for the homeless, and we partner with nonprofits already. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Do one more question, and then we'll start with our wrap up. Okay. <clears throat> uh, last week, the city council voted to reinstate the city's teen curfew. 
that expired this past January. We'll give some background on this in case the audience doesn't know. Persons below the age of seven, of 16 and younger cannot be in a public place or in the premises of any establishment between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Now, since this has already been passed by the current city council, we're gonna ask this question. If you had opportunity, if you could do something different, what would you do to decriminalize the teen curfew. What would you do to decriminalize a teen curfew? What alternatives would you propose? Okay, so look, I was a former educator at Spruce High School. Is, uh, is everyone familiar with that school? It's located in Pleasant Grove. And one thing that we saw a lot of is yes, students leave school, students walking around, kids are walking around at night. You know, it's not that the kid is bad. It's not that he's a criminal. Um, it's just he doesn't have anything to do. I mean, if you're or he's working, you know, a lot of my kids work just to support their families because their mother worked and they had to work and they have brothers and sisters that they had to provide for because their mothers worked and they didn't have a father. I mean, there should be, if, if it was up to me, the, the time frame that you have, 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., we, we all know that our children are not gonna follow that. So what you're doing is you're basically enticing them to say, basically try me. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Thank you. Mr. Peters. Uh, boy, it was made to my, uh, my, my attention that there was an opportunity to de de decriminalize this um, to where it, it'll find the, the, ch the parent about $50 or so opposed to criminalizing the, ch uh, the child. And this uh, option was actually denied, which I thought was a, um, a, you know, a, a good idea opposed to uh, criminalizing you, um, putting them in jail or, or giving them warrants. And basically this is um, the school to prison pipeline right in our face that our uh, city council members uh, place in effect. This is only going to strain the working class uh, people. This is um, another opportunity to uh, pass stop and frisk here in Dallas, Texas uh, in our youth. So what you're doing is criminalizing a generation. Um, you're putting a generation in jail and they, they won't be uh, attributed by their contributions to society, but they're, um, they're being criminalized before they uh, made adulthood. So um, I would, I would, um, um, reverse that. I would try to work to reverse that, but I think the initial option to find the parents fifty dollars, opposed to criminalize a child, was a good option. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Mr. Thomas. Let's get some facts on the table. Okay. First of all, this has been was in effect for almost thirty years. Okay. In 1991 is when this went to effect, and it was community led. It wasn't from the city council. It wasn't from the city attorneys. There were neighborhood leaders like Betty Colbert and Edna Pemberton who led this effort and actually drew up the ordinance. And so those were the first people I talked with when this came up. Actually, if our city manager, and he fell on the sword, would have informed the council that this was coming up, we could have addressed it a long time ago. Okay, now, let's talk about the ordinance. One of the things that's in the ordinance is the fact that you get two written, we're talking about 10 to 16 year olds, okay? I had two community meetings. One, our breakfast we have monthly with the neighborhood leaders. Two, we had a community meeting at Luby's. And at that, both meetings, both of the, uh, we had a consensus that we want to maintain this curfew. Because if my kid is out and I don't know about it after 11 o'clock, I want him or her brought back home. In Thank almost you. 30 years, we've only had one case. One Thank case. you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Thompson. I was asked, I was asked about this, uh, and uh, Councilman Thomas is right. Teen cur curfew has been on the books for a good long while. The problem has been over the years is how the law is being enforced and in a lot of instances it's being selectively enforced. And that's not the only law. It depends on you know who they're dealing with, what they're doing and so forth, and they go back to some of these old laws. I don't want to see any kid uh, with a criminal record or a certain label on them if it's not absolutely necessary. But we also have to understand that we've got some kids based on their background, environment, that it's nothing anyone can do with them. 
We can put them in programs. We can try to rehabilitate them. And Lord knows that's what I want to see happen. But at the end of the day, I think the parent is responsible. Thank you very much for your response. <laughs> We're done. I'm going to do closing remarks. And um, thank you so much for, again, everyone being here this evening, uh, coming out to hear these uh, candidates for District 3. Everyone cares about what's going on in District 3. And we're going to, you started the last one. So we're going to start with Mr. Peters and then follow to the end. Again, we're going to go from one minute to two minutes. Up to two minutes. You don't have to take the whole two minutes, but I know some of you can talk the whole two minutes. <laughs> Ten minutes. So we'll try to keep it under two, okay? Thank you, sir. Well, once again, my name is Devontae D. Peters. I appreciate everyone's time here. I appreciate Heritage Oak Cliff for, for putting this together. Um, I want to represent you because I feel like I, I am um, the one who's going to get the job done. I'm honest. Uh, I have a moral compass. Uh, I'm all about integrity and working for the uh, working class people and not uh, putting uh, our issues uh, uh, under uh, big business and big corporations. So if you want a real progressive change in Dallas, if you want somebody who's, who's going to be honest, who's going to be here for you and not take uh, donations uh, illegally, I'm your man, Devontae D. Peters, D3. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Peters. Mr. Thomas. First, I want to say thank you to her to Joe Cliff. Uh, this has probably been one of the most informative candidate forums that I've participated in. And so, um, I'll leave you with this. Experience matters. Amen. Experience matters. You need someone who has the knowledge, who has the temperament, who has the ability to represent your interests on a daily basis on the Dallas City Council. You need someone who knows how to count to eight. You have to be able to work with other people. You have to be able to get along with other people. You have to be able to, in some cases, compromise in order to make sure that those things that are most important to you are done. I've had the privilege and the honor to represent you on the Dallas City Council. I thank you for being here. I thank you for your support up to this point. I ask that you continue to be engaged in this process. I think after hearing us for almost an hour and a half, the choice is clear. I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, we know that you need someone who has the knowledge, the experience, and the temperament to serve you on the Dallas City Council. My name is Casey Thomas. I'm your council member. I ask for your vote and your support. I'm number three on the ballot, number three for District 3. Thank you for coming out. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Compton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, thank you for having me. Um, as Mr. Peters said, I'm the one tonight and uh, listening to each candidate and I hope you will think, give strong consideration to the candidate that you're most interested in. I'd also like to take a moment to uh, address some things that uh, were said. Uh, the gentleman back there, I heard, uh, I saw your face when I said about, uh, made a comment about these kids. Trust me, uh, my wild child, and I love her to death. But no matter what the family did to steer her in one direction, she was determined to make poor choices and go in another direction. So I had to get out of the enabling business in order to help her. And today, she's an upstanding citizen. But those are the things I'm talking about. Uh, now, I'm interested and serving as the council person for this district because I want to make sure that all of District 3 is represented. What I see right now is only about a fourth of the district they're receiving the resources and the representation that they deserve. We need somebody who can fairly and evenly manage resources, look for resources, and help these communities take care of just their basic services and the infrastructure need. And that's what I want to do, is to focus on the needs of the citizens 
that actually live in District 3. And they pay taxes, but their money is basically going to other areas. The last thing I want to uh, address about those campaign contributions, it's not illegal to take Thank contributions you, from uh, developers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Scott. Okay, thank you. All right, Lewis, come here. This young man that is coming up here is the brother that I raised by myself, okay? And when I look at him and I look at you all, I am fighting for you, to work for you, to represent you. Yes, I can count to eight and I can count to three billion, okay? And I know that resources can be better allocated for you and your families. I know there are resources out there to assist you when you are in need. <laughs> he, he follows instructions too. <laughs> but I'm, I'm fighting to represent you, okay? I'm fighting to keep you informed. I'm fighting to be the transparency that you deserve. I am fighting to constantly communicate with you. It's never going to be a send me an email and I'll get one of my staff members to get with you. No, if I have to, I'll come meet you at your house, which I have done. Sat down, had dinner, had a conversation with their families. When I say that I am genuinely concerned, I am genuinely concerned. Not for the money, but for you and, before, and for the resources that you deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Scott. And please, let's continue with a round of applause for all of the candidates. Who